listening to The Review on the OSG Sports Podcasting Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Review. It's the Online Sports Guys College Football Podcast featuring us, the Online Sports Guys, because our name wouldn't be on it if we weren't hosting it. Excellent point. (laughs) As we record this... Excuse me, we are roughly uh, about one week away from the kick, the official week zero kickoff of the college football season. Never heard of it. And we want to talk a little bit about those games here before as we go. But I want to start off with we finished last week. For those of you who got a chance to catch last week's episode, we talked a little bit about some previews. I want to talk a little bit about SEC and Big Ten football because those are kind of the big dogs um conference wise uh with the teams most of the teams expected to be um within your top 10 are going to come from this conference and we'll start off we'll talk about the big 10 because i want to bring up something that i just read a couple minutes ago while i was doing some preparation for this um ohio state athletic director ross bjork okay <laughs> And I wish Marty was here to talk about this too, but Marty had a previous engagement and couldn't join us. Um, He talked about um, starting quarterback for this season, Will Howard, and the fact that the team spent roughly $20 million building out their roster, which sounds, maybe it's just me, but it sounds vaguely professional. (laughs) Oh. Well, that's the, what we're going into. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, I, there's a collective there that Ohio state has that is willing to pay top dollar for their talent. So you got to realize it may seem jarring to you, but this is what we're in now. We're in the, the era where we're talking about uh, um, who's spending the most money. I'm sure pretty soon uh, it's going to be published uh, somewhere on uh, the, on, on a web page or on the, on X or what, or insert your social media channel here. Um, so th- that shouldn't shock you in-, in the era that we're in now in college athletics. Uh, I-, I think the challenge now, uh, is, um, are they getting a return on that investment for those that are, are, are spending the money? And that's kind of where we're at right now. And you can see in some programs where that return on investment just isn't there. Nothing like having to look at profit and loss statements more yeah more in depth than we have before because you've On got an amateur level well yeah and i mean what it, the way it used to be was you'd look at a program like maryland and, and sit there and go okay maryland is operating at a loss on their own and this is before all the discussion that we you know are currently engaged in but you have you have a maryland that is losing money hand over fist eight figures to the left of the decimal place and they decide to make a financial decision to switch conferences. Now you are dealing with universities. Well, that, that was after they shed about six or seven sports. Right. <laughs> and you, you add that to the mix as well, but now you're dealing with the economics of today with NIL and figuring out, okay, how much are we investing or how much are our collectives investing? How much of our boosters are investing? outside of our own athletic budgets to help things out to where we can allegedly be competitive now. And so then this adds that extra level of what does the profit and loss statement look like now? How does how is it reported? And how does all of this money that's invested by all of these outside sources and opportunities turning into wins and losses? And we're going to have folks that are going to sit there and analyze now the idea of Dollars per win and return on investment, stuff that we normally talk about in the New York Stock Exchange on Monday through Friday. Now we're going to be talking about on Saturday with college athletics. And those investment dollars are moving toward players. I was talking to a coworker of mine who played for Frank Beamer at Virginia Tech. Uh, he coaches over at Mount Pisgah, which is a private school right by my house um, that uh, has a really good football program. Uh, and we were discussing the shift in investment to the players away from the the facilities. Remember the arms race we had about 20 years ago, all these indoor facilities are, were being, uh, built and, uh, all these new shiny toys were being 
uh, um, were being built in these football facilities. And then yeah. it kind of bled over to men's basketball and then baseball kind of uh, got some of that and some of the, some of the non-rev sports that are popular. Uh, that's come to a screeching halt. I mean, that ended about three years ago. I don't hear about, hey, uh, the uh, uh, Georgia football program is building a, uh, a new tower for their football program. Uh, I, I don't hear those things anymore. And that's because investment dollars are moving away from the facilities now and to the players. Yeah, the and, most, famous, uh, the most famous of those investments might be the LSU Lazy River. <laughs> yes, or the slide at Clemson. <laughs> which actually slid down and it's it's kind of fun. I would hope um, it slides down because if it didn't slide down, that would be a problem. <laughs> that would be an elevator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that that's what's happening. I mean, yeah, twenty million dollars doesn't shock me anymore. Uh, that's that's what you got to do now to um, to have a, a top level college football program now, uh, at least for most people uh, who have the uh, dollars to invest. Well, I'll ask both of you guys this question with that kind of investment in some of the players that Ohio state has coming back to play this year. Is there anybody in the big 10 that could even run with them at this point? Oregon. Yeah. Penn state on the outside. Too. Penn state. Mm -hmm. Penn state always seems to be that team nipping at the heels, but never quite getting over that hurdle. Is the that very good? Yeah. Is that something that changes this year, or are we still talking about James Franklin coaching a nine-win team? James Franklin coaching a nine-win team. Probably. Okay. Maybe a 10. They might surprise somebody down the road. Yeah. Uh, you know, Really, to me, Ohio State, Oregon, uh, Michigan, Penn State, and um, are really the top four. Um, take your pick about who will win the conference. Um, I know I've got, I think it's October 6th, circled on my calendar when Ohio state goes to Eugene, Oregon to play the Oregon ducks, uh, which should be epic mm. and should be, it will be the start of what I think is going to be an, a, an epic rivalry uh, in the big 10. You know, we've talked about the last few months, um, the, and we kind of joked about uh, the West coast coming to the big 10 and, you know, after I paused and reflected about it, now that we're getting into the season, I think this is a breath of fresh air for the Big Ten that the four West Coast schools join the league. Uh, when you, uh, we're situated in the Southeast, we are we all eat, drink, and sleep SEC football here. Uh, but the three of us and Marty and 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 uh, J Dub, we all kind of appreciate the other regions in college football, and um, the Big Ten has always had that. Uh, uh, upper Midwest, uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of a grayish, um, uh, reputation, uh, and, uh, they haven't changed their ways. Uh, Ohio state, Michigan always plays for the big 10 title. Uh, now you got some fresh blood and a few programs, uh, that can challenge, uh, for, um, for the title. And as I said, in one of my videos, um, you've got the old school Ohio State Big Ten, Woody Hayes, and three three yards in a cloud of dust against the the twenty uh, first century college football program with the with the multiple uniforms and the Nike marketing uh, kind of colliding now. And I think it it's just a breath of fresh air for the Big Ten that you brought these schools in, and I think it's going to in the long run really. You know, we've talked about how the Big Ten is elevated and. And now one of the marquee conferences along with the SEC, it really makes them relevant uh, against the SEC now. And uh, I, I think it's a great thing for this league uh, going forward to add these teams in. Are we forgetting about USC here, a team that's been no. in the 10 for the no, last No, I included them. I said the four West Coast schools that have come in and injected some kind of life but, into the big but Ten. in this conference that's loaded with um the ohio states and michigans and even the oregon of the world are is usc just kind of an afterthought in this conversation i I'm, wouldn't go ahead john uh just when you look at usc's season it can go anywhere i mean it, it is so wildly divergent what it could be on both the good and the bad. I mean, this is no Caleb Williams at quarterback. 
and you're going to have to start your season off beating Dancing Brian Kelly uh, at a neutral site to start your season. And then a couple of weeks later, you're going to Columbus in, in a welcome to Big Ten kind of a deal. It, it could be a 10-2 and two season, but with the adjustments that you have, it could be a lot worse, and I mean a lot worse. And in, in like the unacceptable realm of worse for USC. So obviously we kind of look at things probably more in the middle. I'm thinking maybe an eight win team. But once again, it's because of that freshness of your schedule now that you have that's involved in your new conference play that will not make it as easy as it was to rack up double digit wins as it has been in the past. I think that USC will be the most uh, the one of the the most challenged teams coming from the West to the East. I think that Oregon is going to be a part of the discussion at the top of the ladder in the B1G. I think that USC, they're going to be, you know, second when it comes to the Western teams being thought of, and it could be a distant second when it comes to those Western teams that were being thought of heading East now. See, I think Southern Cal is going to benefit from the Big Ten moving to into the Big Ten. Uh, because now I think they have something that they can sell a little better to the, the talent that's all over the uh, L.A. and Orange County, uh, all over Southern California, the high school talent. No and and Lincoln Riley, look, as much as we criticize him, um, he's still an elite offensive coach. And any five-star quarterback, you're going to want to play for Lincoln Riley. And any uh, – elite receiver, even offensive lineman, want to want to be a part of that offense. It's the other side of the ball that where USC's got to do some soul searching and figure out how to get that to work and who can who can uh, be that defensive coordinator, that strong defensive coordinator uh, to uh, bring the elite defensive talent into, into uh, Southern California and play for the Trojans. That's where the soul searching is. I agree with you. I think it's going to be – uh, it could be a, a very mediocre season for Southern Cal. Uh, it could be a good season for Southern Cal. I think where we can be in agreement here is it's going to be a season of adjustment for the for the Trojans. And um, I don't. I think Lincoln Riley's job is safe. Um, I don't think anything's going to happen. But I like the position Southern California is in, as opposed to the other LA school, UCLA, which is kind of in disarray right now. Mm -hmm. But I want to bring up one team in, in the Big Ten that I think is really crapshoot season for them, and that's the University of Washington. Uh, you got a new head coach. You got a new quarterback, Will Rogers. You've got a new receiving core, which isn't that bad. They did a good job in the transfer portal getting some getting some quality receivers. They're, just, they're the biggest question mark, and I read somewhere where they're like the college football is – and the college football expansion team right now. Uh, we just don't know what they have. And I think they're positioned perfectly in the predictions being somewhere between nine and 10 in the, in the league, because nobody knows mm -hmm. it, it could be a four, one season. It could be a 10, one season. Uh, so Washington to me is the mystery. Uh, I, I think Jed fish is a, a coach and a great coach in, in the waiting uh, he saw an opportunity to go back home to Seattle and coach the coach the Huskies. Uh, and he left a really good uh, program in Arizona that he built. Uh, so that's the mystery team to me in the Big Ten. And nothing like having the possibility of your old team doing better than you in your new environment. With your players. With your players. I mean, if things go right for Arizona, you could be 11-1 and one because of what Jed Fish has built. If, because of Jed Fish's exit, things do not go well, it could go completely off the rails for Arizona in a, in a 500 season. So it, I, yeah. it would be intriguing to see how this Jed Fish group responds to not having Jed Fish there. And so I think that that's the biggest question for me when it comes to Arizona, who could have a, who legitimately could have a better season than yeah. Fish in his new gig. Yeah. Indeed. Got to move on here because we're a little bit strapped for time this week. Um, we got to talk SEC here. Why? Uh, the come because they're kind of the big dog when it comes to college football. Never heard of them. 
conversation has to start with the Georgia Bulldogs, the preseason number one in the AP poll, pretty much universally regarded as that team. But if you look at that schedule, there is no guarantee that they come out of that schedule as the number one team at the end of the season because it's a killer. Mm -hmm. But if any team has a talent and the depth to do it, it's Georgia. And really that Texas game in Austin is another circle, the schedule type game. Uh, that uh, will kind of determine things uh, at least midway through the season. Uh, the SEC, to me, there's four teams that have a chance to win, and it's Georgia, Texas, Alabama, and Ole Miss. Alabama? Okay. Yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I Alabama, to me, with Jalen Milrow at quarterback, and look, I think Kalen DeBoer is an elite head coach. Oh, yeah. uh, he did it at Fresno State in short in a short period of time, he did it at Washington in a short period of time. Now he's inheriting another starting quarterback that has a record, a positive record, got him in the playoff last year, and they didn't lose a whole lot on offense or defense. I mean, it's still Alabama. They've, they've got players. Uh, and what, by all accounts, what I'm reading, they're responding positively to Kalen DeBoer and his style. So I, I've got to think Alabama is got a, le a a big shot into winning the SEC. This Ole Miss team is probably the best one in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that what uh, Coach Kiffin is uh, not Monty, but uh, Lane Kiffin is built. Um, so um, it's really to me between those four teams. I mean Texas, they've, uh, they've had, they're having some injury issues with the, that running back core. Uh, so. Yeah, I've kind of I'm I'm a little hesitant on, on the horns right now, uh, but long term I really like what Sark's doing there, and and that could be the dominant team in in the SEC in uh, the near future. Uh, yeah, but really, it's really those four teams to me that have a shot to win the SEC. And you mentioned Ole Miss. Ole Miss's schedule helps them out a great deal because yeah. they don't hit the road until week six. Yeah. And that game is at the fairgrounds taking on South Carolina. So I think that when you look at Ole Miss, they should, in quotation marks, italicized, you know, font that under blocks quickly. <laughs> they should get out of the blocks at five and zero. Oh. That test on the road at South Carolina, that should tell us, I think, a whole lot about where Ole Miss's head is when it comes to this season. You mentioned the others in that group. You know, Alabama, they have the the game against Georgia on September 28th. I think that that obviously will go a long way. I think that one will tell us more about Alabama than it will about Georgia because. Yeah. And that's good. By the way, folks, that's going to be a primetime game, 8 p.m. on ABC. Primetime. Uh, I think that that one tells us a lot more about Alabama at that stage of the season than it does about Georgia. I think a lot of folks who are staring at Georgia – as your de facto number one contender for winning the CFP by the time it's over, they're thinking that, yes, that win in Tuscaloosa will be Georgia's. It may not necessarily be a fait accompli. It'll be a grinder. They'll get out with a win. If Alabama shows themselves you know, and they account themselves well in that game, then I think that the season will continue to, to grow with Kalen DeBoer as head coach. If Georgia goes into Tuscaloosa, and takes the newspaper and swats uh, Alabama across the nose with it, then you're, you're going to have folks who are going to sit there and go, okay, well, and you're, you're going to have an overreaction. You're going to have an overreaction Sunday and an overreaction Monday when it comes to that game and how that impacts what's going on with Alabama. So in Texas, obviously we look at Red River and what's going to go there on October the 12th. You're, you've got Michigan, what, Michigan in week two? And then – Michigan in week two, and the, you don't leave the state of Texas until, I believe, November. Right. Um, my uh, my uh, iPad died, so I don't have the schedules in front not, of me. That's not allowed, sir. But, I mean, uh, where, where Texas is going to maybe stub their toe is toward the end of the season because they're renewing some old Southwest Conference rivalries in November – and they're both on the road at Arkansas. We'll see what that Arkansas team is like in November and and uh, if Sam Pittman is still there, and I think he still will be there. 
but they closed the season at Texas A&M. And look, that is a petty rivalry. Um, and they're going to renew acquaintances for the first time in 11 years. And A&M is kind of my mystery team in the SEC because of Mike Elko is bringing some toughness back to Texas A&M. And we saw what he did at Duke. Mm -hmm. And he turned that into a really tough football team. And in the short term, if he can get A&M, uh, especially when you get into the late stages of the season, to be that tough, menacing football team that he did, that he had at um, at Duke, and then where he was at, as defensive coordinators at Wake and at uh, Notre Dame, um, I would give A and M a good shot of of winning that uh, with all the emotion that's going to be stirred up at Kyle Field, where over a hundred thousand people will jam well, into. Well, well, finally be filling out that stadium for a chance. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's where I think Texas could stub their toe. Uh, you know, rivalry games scare me. Um, November 11th, when they play Arkansas, you bet I'm going to be in my red and white because the rivalry is back. Yeah. Um, at least in my opinion. Uh, so, but that, that, that's kind of where I see Texas would probably um, uh, hiccup a little bit. So here, here's your, I'll, I'll be your iPad for a second. Please do. They start. With, it's they, flatlined over here. Yeah, they start with Colorado <laughs> State. They start with Colorado State at home. Then they go to Michigan, and that one is on. That's a noon kick on Big Fox. Then the home games take over: Texas San Antonio, Louisiana Monroe, Mississippi State. Then you end up with a bye week leading into Red River. Then the following week, Georgia comes to uh, to DKR. Then you've got a, a trip to Vanderbilt. Then you've got another bye week. Then you've got Florida on the 9th of November coming to Austin. Then you go to Arkansas for the game that you were talking about. Then you host Kentucky. Then you go to A&M. So you, you look at that schedule, and there are a couple of whoop de doos in there. But the, the early home games to kind of get you revved up into the season, if you get past Michigan, then you can kind of navigate yourself and get everything squared away because you get to the bye week to get you ready for Red River, and then you hit stage two of the schedule, and that's when I that's when I think that uh, Texas, if you're Steve Sarkeesian, is hoping to be at full song coming out of that bye week and getting into the rivalry, the first rivalry game in Red River. Yeah, you're talking. You're looking at a team there that could easily go anywhere from nine and three in the regular season to running the table. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Depending and, uh, how things play out, because even though they play Michigan, this is a Michigan team that's completely rebuilding, uh, pretty much from the from the floor up, uh -huh. and may not be quite ready for what they see with Texas and Quinny Quinn Ewers this early that early in the season. Turn their khaki, they turn their khaki pants into fabletics, I think, uh, when it mm -hmm. comes to everything. On the, but yeah, you you look at the the back to back rivalry uh, games in stage two where you go Red River, then you go home to Georgia. That That's going to be the the two weeks where everybody's going to sit there and figure out, okay, do we do we grip or do we rip when it comes to taxes? Thank you, John Daly. Um... <laughs> it should have been for Wilkie when he was talking about the Arkansas game later in the season. Yeah, I want to go. Want to move on here because, we, like I mentioned earlier, we've got a little bit of a shortened episode of the review this week, and I want to talk about Week Zero because we've got a couple of games. We only have four games, but there a couple of them are pretty interesting here, matchup wise. And I'll start with Florida State and Georgia Tech playing in beautiful, beautiful Dublin, Ireland. Yeah, we're an eleven and a half point favorite, and the, the over unders at fifty six and a half, my friend. So that's where we are. With a noon, with, yeah. a, with a noon kick, Eastern uh, point. Again, first games of a regular season are uneasy to me uh, oh, yeah. because we just don't know. Uh, this is the first time that these two teams have played somebody else, but then themselves. Yeah. Uh, so, in a normal world, you would think that Florida State would, um, you know, obviously favored and. We'd all feel comfortable about that, but it's the first game of the season. Oh, by the way, you're playing in Dublin, Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think there will be a strong contingent uh, from both teams going to Dublin. True. Um, I like what they're doing at Georgia Tech. I yeah. like Hayes King. 
Uh, he's got some good offensive talent behind him. No. Um, Brett Key no. believes in building within within the offensive line. Um, you know, I, I, if there's a concern for me, it's defensively. How can Georgia Tech's defense match the speed and the skill of the skill players of FSU? Uh, they're still they're still elite over there. And Mike Norvell is a reputation of of coaching some really elite offenses. Uh, that to me would be the key. And if FSU doesn't make mistakes, you know, I really like the Seminoles in this game. Uh, but I wouldn't discount Georgia Tech and their scrappiness. And look, I think they're going to be a little better than people think they are going to be. Uh, I really like what they're doing over there. Uh, I agree. I don't like the 11 and a half. I really don't. I don't know if they get to the total either because it's the first game out of the blocks. You're caught in all the sightseeing. You're caught in all the tours. You're, you're being led around in this. Uh, you're drinking Guinness. You're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, you know, <laughs> it's spending a lot of time eating haggis and, and you know, sampling. You know, you get all of the promotional photos about, uh, you know, hey, we're here in Dublin, you know, and all those kinds of things. I don't think it gets to 11 and a half. I don't think it gets to 56 and a half. And I shoot. <laughs> Georgia Tech worries me. Yes, as I'm the Florida State alum on this show. Georgia Tech, <laughs> Georgia Tech worries me. I'm perpetually worried anyway. And like I said, I don't think they get to the total or the number. Yeah, I think this is a game where if this was being played later in the season, that that um, total point, the total point spread might be a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But because it's week, it's week zero. I, I wouldn't expect a high scoring game either, but I like, I agree with both of you guys. Georgia Tech may not be a team that gets the national love that some of the other teams in the ACC and in the Power Five get, but it's a team that could be dangerous as the season goes on. Yep. They're going to upset some people. It's just a matter of whom. And as a side note, I highly recommend the tour of the Guinness plant in beautiful Dublin, Ireland, because it is a lot of fun. Hopefully okay. they get to go up to the top of that uh, little tower that they have there. It's a blast. Mm-hmm. Um, moving on to one of the, the next game in line, 4 p.m. kickoff Eastern time in beautiful University Stadium in Albuquerque. New Mexico, Montana State versus New Mexico. Yep. Uh, right now, Montana State's a nine. Total's 53 and a half, and it's football on a budget. You can get in for as low as 18 bucks. Mm-hmm. All, the, all the other games that we're going to talk about are football on a budget, by the way. Um, and for I, those of you who don't know what football on a budget is. and have Learn a, about it. And have learn a, about it. Go show. back and listen to our old episodes. We talk about games you can get into for under 20 bucks. Yes. So uh, right now, 18 bucks to get into University Stadium. New Mexico is just not very good. Uh, Montana State to be favored by nine is a is a shocker. I think that that may say more about New Mexico than it does Montana State. So uh, games on FS1, you can get in on football on a budget, get in the door for 18 bucks, go see some college football in week zero. I don't know if it gets to the nine. I don't know if it gets to the 53 and a half Wilkie. So I'll go under on both of those, but I think Montana state gets the Duke. I like the Bobcats in this game. Uh, and uh, I'm probably the only one here that's been to Missoula and uh, great tailgating at, at Montana state. If you like uh, the old West type of tailgating, uh, had a great time doing that. No, I've been and I've been to Albuquerque. It's an interesting I've place. I've been to Albuquerque too. It's yeah, it's you're right. It's interesting. It's probably gonna be pretty warm out there. Uh moving on to our night games. Uh 8 p.m. kickoff in beautiful Mac Mac McKay Stadium. I started to say Mackey. McKay Stadium in Reno, Nevada. Uh SMU traveling up to northern Nevada to take on the Nevada. 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 Mm-hmm. The Wolf Pack. The Wolf Pack. Mm-hmm. Um, tickets, um, again, football on a budget. You can get in for 13 bucks if you happen to find yourself in Reno for that game. Uh, the line is 56, and SMU's favored by 27. Yikes. Yeah. Take the ponies and the points. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I will defer to you on that one. I wasn't I wasn't thinking that that margin, I know that Nevada is not a very good team, but I didn't know if since it's week zero, you'd be getting to 27 and a half. Um, 
and then and if if that is the case then you're thinking that SMU is going to be doing most of the heavy lifting and if it's going to be blowout city like that you're looking at you know 44 13 somewhere in there so if Wilkie, you're thinking it's going to be something in that 43, 44, 45, 13 margin to get to 56 and a half and SMU to cover. Sounds good to me. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I will defer to you. I figured SMU would win just because we don't know what we're going to be seeing out of Nevada. So I'll say SMU wins. We may not get to the total because SMU would have to do most of the heavy lifting. And uh, then I think that they get close to covering, but I don't think they do. And then finally, our final game of the night, uh, Delaware State blowing most of their athletics budget for 2024 by traveling out to Hawaii to take on the Rainbow Warriors at 11.59 Eastern time in Hawaii at beautiful Clarence T.C. Ching Athletics Complex. Know it, brother. Uh, Delaware State's being paid, being paid handsomely to, to come out there, um, I'm sure. Uh, they'll they'll hey, find a, a couple of programs out of it. You're getting uh, the Delaware. Hang on. I'm I'm using the Google machine here before we go. I'm gonna go with Hawaii though. Yeah, I am too. Uh, yeah, if for no other reason, just for the fact that Delaware State probably will be a little bit travel weary having to fly across the US and half of the Pacific Ocean just to get to the game. Okay. So um da, 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 hi, uh bookmakers review like i said i'm trying to sit here and, and see if someone has posted the payout for that particular game and i have yet to... while you're doing that i will add that again another um bonus game you could get in if you happen to find yourself in hawaii on vacation or traveling for business really? 13 dollars to get in the door oh absolutely that's absolutely true uh, da, 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 uh, Hornets of FCS one in ten last year brought in via a matchmaker as a week zero replacement for Oregon, which withdrew from their date with UH heading into their first year as a member of the B1G. So apparently Hawaii and Oregon are discussing whether to play that game plus a 2031 game at Oregon in later years, or if UH will take a payout for the Ducks' withdrawal, according to uh, according to uh, Craig Angel. Close. So uh, the uh, UH athletic so, director. So somebody wrote a nice large check to Delaware State to fund a couple of mm -hmm. athletic programs and their and their uh, travel costs. Mm -hmm. And um, here you are. Yeah. So the number has not been posted, but it, it won't be posted. <laughs> but, uh, but, well, no, no, no. I mean the the payout number. The the pay if the payout number was posted, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for the payday for. Uh, the Hornets to travel from one end of the planet to the other. And I have yet to see that in a, in a quick, uh, the only wager you're going to see is if Delaware skate can score a touchdown. Yeah. yeah. Or There's maybe not. double digit in points. Yeah. I'm, and I mean, De Delaware state, I anticipate that they will not be with a full roster heading to Hawaii. I'm sure that they will set a limit on, on the number of folks that are heading from one end of the planet to the other. So we'll see what it looks like there, but yeah. So matchmaker, Delaware State to the big, big island, and you get your payday. Yeah, I know we got less than a minute. Go ahead and send us home. <laughs> uh, well, sorry we couldn't go a little longer this week, guys. Um, time is uh, our enemy, as the saying goes. Um, lots of lots of ground to cover. We are about to hit the kickoff for the season. When we come back next week. We'll have a whole lot more college football to talk about. Lots of previews of games to talk about. Lots of um, updates on what happened during the first week of the college football season. So for OSG Wilkie, for OSG Nelson, oh, I you. am. He's yeah. OSG Phil. That's OSG Wilkie. I'm OSG Nelson. We're out. Yep, got to go. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll catch you again next week. Bye. Hey, thanks. Bye.